I spent a lot of my early 20s hitchhiking around and as a result have a lot of unique stories to tell, though only one that really belongs here. My story starts about five years ago I was heading north just outside of a small rural village trying to get to around Lake Superior so that I could head out west. If you've ever taken a look at a map of Ontario, or spoken to any Canadian hitchhikers they'll tell you this is the most difficult leg of a cross-Canada hitchhiking trip as it's quite a distance, and the roadways include a lot of detours through a lot of extremely remote areas and the rural areas become less and less frequent. I'd been out on the road for about a week at this point, and had mediocre luck obtaining rides from my southern Ontario starting point so far, though today was proving to be less than stellar. It was a Sunday, most people aren't out driving around North Ontario on a Sunday, and the weather was cool and drizzly. It felt like a cool fall day even though it was mid-June at this point. My journey was weighing on me this time and I decided to stop to for lunch in an attempt to improve my spirits. I had been surviving mostly off of packets of ramen for most of the trip so it wasn't very nourishing, and the light rain made it so it wasn't worth starting a fire to try to warm them up or boil them or anything so I ate them dry, washing them down with my water from my canteen. I lingered at that spot in the road, not in any hurry to get up and go, I wasn't in any rush, I was out here for the journey after all so I sat and took in the surroundings. I was sitting next to a big open farmer's field. Lots of brush and small wooded pockets of land perfect for camping. I half wanted to call it a day and curl up inside my little tent and hide away from the world. In the end, however, I got back up on my feet as I always did to keep walking, when suddenly a car appeared in the distance behind me. My heart skipped a beat, not too many people on the road today, and the prospect of being picked up and progressing out of this desolate, lonely stretch of highway had me excited. As the vehicle approached, I stuck my thumb out, and to my astonishment, the car slowed down. It was a white sedan, for doors, a little dinged up, quite dirty with rust forming around the wheel wells. I wasn't too concerned with the appearance of the car, though as most people up here picking up hitchhikers are quite friendly. I picked up the pace and hurried up to the car that was just down the road from me. I could see the driver eyeing me through the passenger side mirror a scruffy dark man with wiry black unkempt hair. As I approached the passenger side door, the car started moving forward accelerating and taking off leaving me very confused on the side of the highway. Had I given this guy a bad vibe? I hadn't shaved in a few days so I probably looked a little rough, but I hadn't expected that. At this point, I was simply feeling a little self-conscious. I kept walking, trying to not let the incident bother me, Though perhaps tonight when I set up camp I decided I should probably go with a change of clothes and a shave. The area I was in wasn't entirely void of human life. There were a few farmhouses and fields scattered off the side of the road. Though there hadn't been any more cars since the white car, and the loneliness of the journey was back on me. It had been a little more than half an hour since I stopped to eat, maybe 40 minutes when suddenly I could see another car approaching in the distance, though this time it was driving towards me, and away from the direction I wanted to go, I felt some comfort in just seeing someone else out there, even if they weren't going to give me a ride. Though that feeling of comfort gave way as the car got nearer, it was the same dirty white car from earlier. I was sure of it, as it got close I could see the rust around the wheel wells. As it got closer the vehicle slowed down. Had he changed his mind and decided to give me a ride? I stopped walking and waited for the vehicle to stop. Only the vehicle didn't stop, not entirely at least it just slowed down to a crawl on the other side of the road, with the driver staring out his window at me, that scruffy face and messy wiry black hair was unmistakable, it was definitely the driver from before. I put my hand up to give an awkward wave, not entirely sure what to do and the driver sped off leaving me behind again. This time I felt more than a little self-conscious, I was feeling unnerved. What had the man wanted? Maybe he was concerned with seeing me hitchhiking in the area? A lot of people had the notion that it's illegal to hitchhike in Canada, even though it's not, and I've confirmed this with a police officer friend of my family. The car was gone out of sight now down the road. Nevertheless, I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that had come over me. He had stared right at me, though he didn't give a wave or any other human acknowledgement. I had felt as if the man had just stared right through me. Now you may be thinking, why not go pack up and camp like you had thought to do earlier? Though this was the last thing on my mind, 
I had absolutely no desire to stay in the stretch of highway any longer. I was determined to make it to a more populated area. As I progressed down the road a ways the rain started to get heavier. I threw on my bright orange rain poncho though the combination of wind and rain was making it so my unprotected pant legs were getting soaked through. I came to a long bend in the road with a small bridge that went over a small creek. I decided to get out of the rain for a bit and sit under the bridge for a bit. The last thing I needed was to catch a cold out here. The area under the bridge was dry with lots of large rocks perfect for finding a spot to sit. Taking my pack off and setting it next to me caused an indescribable release of pressure that felt absolutely wonderful. Even though I always pack light, when your entire life was in one backpack the pressure adds up over the course of the day. Sitting there in the cool dry spot under the bridge I let my muscles unwind as I reflected on the day's events, which up until the white car had been quite drab. The more I thought about the incident the more I started to chalk it up to being an overreaction on my part. It had been a depressing gray sky day, with rain on and off in the middle of nowhere, of course I was going to feel a bit on edge. Maybe the guy had thought I was someone else or just didn't appreciate hitchhikers in the area, or possibly even even was just trying to mess with me a bit and thought he was being funny. After about an hour the rain had started to let up, and the sun had even started to show. It was late afternoon at this point so I decided I should get back at it. As I lifted the pack onto my shoulders the familiar weight put the strain back on my muscles and I was brought back into travel mode. Making my way out from under the bridge I heard a vehicle approaching. Rushing out from under the bridge I stumbled and fell causing me to bang my knee painfully against a rock. Quickly getting up I hurried out up to the road though by then it was too late. Whoever it was had passed me by. Just my luck, probably the one person of the day who would have given me a lift to the next town. Moving at a steady pace along the road now I passed the curve of the road and was met with a long stretch of highway that looked flat as far as my eyes could see. The road had some deep marshy ditches along either side filled with cattails and then thick pine trees and dead brush that looked to be quite marshy. If no one picked me up, I felt this was going to be an extremely long stretch of road. These kind of days seemed to creep up once in a while. Long dull lonely days that made me wonder what I was doing out here in the first place. It would be easy to call it quits, get to the next town with a bus station and I had enough money to catch bus all the way back home and crash at my parents place for a bit. Knowing I had this option was always a comfort on days like today but it was going to take more than this to make me give up. The sun was just starting to set. I still had a few hours until dark though I decided then to really pick up my pace so I wouldn't be stuck camping in this weird, almost marshy dead area. I saw another car approaching me from ahead. A feeling of anxiety washed over me this time instead of the usual comfort that I felt seeing another human being in these particularly lonesome areas. Something just didn't feel quite right. As the car approached closer I felt my heart sink into my stomach as I realized it was that white car again. How had he gotten ahead of me this time? And what was he doing out here? I reminded myself to breath and try to stay calm. He hadn't done anything to hurt me, and this probably wasn't anything sinister. But when you're alone in the middle of nowhere it's easy for your imagination to get the better of you. And this car was really giving me the creeps. This time the car went by without incident. The driver though staring at me out of his driver's side door didn't slow down or do anything out of the ordinary. The car kept going down the road until it hit the bend and disappeared from sight. Feeling seriously freaked out I kept telling myself to breath, stay calm and keep moving. If I saw another car I'd flag them down and explain the situation. Maybe they'd give me a ride into the next town. People up here are generally extremely friendly and helpful. Moving further down the road the sun started to dip down more and more as evening set in. There was probably only another two hours or so before it got really dark and I'd have no choice but to really stop and make camp as hitchhiking in the night is a really bad idea. Not slowing down I was moving down the road when I heard the far off sound of another vehicle. My stomach jumped up and felt like it was being tied in a knot. Was it the white car again? It was pretty far away at a distance I had no way of telling if it was white or not. So I stood anxiously watching, waiting for the approach but it didn't seem to be moving very quickly. I stood there watching for a few minutes and I was now sure whoever it was wasn't moving but rather had stopped in the middle of the road. Not wanting to miss out on valuable daylight hours I kept moving, 
though I decided to walk backwards and keep my eye on the distant driver. Several minutes passed without movement. The tension I felt mounted as I continued walking backwards. I had to fight with my legs that seemed to want to take off on their own a cord into the boggy wood cover. Convincing myself that it was probably not worth getting worked up about, and to keep breathing, I steadily counted each step backwards trying to keep calm. Suddenly the vehicle was moving again, heading in this direction. Pretty soon I'd know if it was the same guy, though I was really hoping that it wasn't. I looked around trying to scout out a path just in case I had to make a run for it, but everywhere off the road was wet and boggy looking. I could run into it, though it'd probably result in soaking myself through and progress in there would be extremely slow. I looked back to the approaching car. It was close enough now that I could clearly see that it was indeed a car, and it was a white car, the white car. I was approaching quickly now. I didn't know what to do. What did this guy want? Why was he just driving up and down the highway in the middle of nowhere? The driver pulled the vehicle up and stopped again, this time about 50 meters away from me. From here, I could see the dark-skinned man with the messy black hair staring at me over the wheel. He made a motion with his hand as if to beckon me over. At this point, there was absolutely no way I was approaching him. Instead, I put my hands up exasperated as if to say, what? The man rolled down his window and yelled at me to, come here. I kept backing away quicker now. There was no way I was getting in the car with this guy. The panic I felt now was barely under control, and I could feel my heart pounding against my chest uncontrollably. I yelled back, I'm fine, I'm just going to walk it from here, thanks. I fumbled in my pockets looking for anything to defend myself with, but I had packed my knife in my bag. There was no way I'd get it out quick enough to be able to use it in my defense. What a stupid place to put it, though I'd always been naive thinking this wasn't something that would ever happen to me. Come here. The man was suddenly shouting ordering me over there. No way in hell was I going there now. I darted across the road thinking I could run off in the other direction, forcing the man to turn around before chancing a dash off into the marshy terrain. The white car sped up and pulled up right beside me. I took a few hurried steps back down the road in the direction I had come to get behind the car. Why did you hide from me? The man yelled out at me. What the hell was he talking about? I had never hidden from this guy. I didn't even know who he was. I didn't hide from you. I don't know what you're talking about. Please just leave me alone. I stuttered back at him scared out of my mind. It was clear this guy was insane at this point. I came back looking for you to offer you a ride and you weren't on the road. You were hiding from me. What you got to hide from? He barked back. Just what the hell was he talking about? Was he the car that passed over me while I was under the bridge hiding from the rain? Anyways, it didn't matter this guy was nuts. I didn't have anything to hide, and I wouldn't get in the car with this guy in a million years so I replied back, I wasn't trying to hide from you. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but I don't need a ride. With a bit of quick thinking I added, I don't need a ride anymore though thank you. I was able to call my friends from nearby on my cell, and they're on their way here to pick me up. The man still sitting in his car just stared at me for a long while as if deciding what to do. I wasn't sure if he bought the lie about friends coming to pick me up though I thought it might discourage him from doing anything crazier. You don't have any friends coming, he said quietly, though he rolled his window up and sped his car off north down the road away from Maine. I could feel my arms and legs shaking uncontrollably now. It was a good thing he didn't get out because I don't know if I would have been able to run. Now the sun was starting to set, and I was in a bit of a situation. I wasn't sure what to do next. I could try walking back the way I came from, and try to make it back to the small town or one of the farmhouses along the road, though that would take a few hours and it'd mean walking in the dark and if that guy decided to come back down the road I'd be a sitting duck in the middle of the road. After standing around for a few minutes in fear on the middle of the highway, I decided that I'd move south back down the highway in the direction I'd come for a little bit, and look for a way into the marshy wooded area and try to find a dry patch of land to set up camp for the night and hope that tomorrow being a weekday I might be able to flag down a car and ask for help. Heading south down the road, I figured the guy might roughly remember where we had our encounter. And he knew that I was headed north. And hoped it might take him off my trail just a bit more. I went from speed walking to a light jog to a slow run, which considering my pack, and how exhausted I was feeling wasn't as easy as it may seem. 
After about 10 of 15 minutes of this I saw what appeared to be a fairly shallow section of the ditch. The ground was piled up a bit higher here it seemed and more water had run off to the sides. Taking care not to make an obvious broken path in the cattails and overgrowth around the ditch I stepped into the shallow water. I say shallow now, but it was still a little over a foot deep. More than enough to let the water come up and spill into my waterproof boots and soak my lower leg. Climbing back out of the ditch onto the wooded side I found it was a lot drier than I had expected, though still definitely marshy and mucky in a lot of spots. There appeared to be several clear areas perfect for setting up for the night. Not wanting to sleep too close to the road for fear of being spotted, but also not wanting to venture too deep into the tree cover I picked a nice spot about 60 or 70 meters in. From here I could see the highway and if he came driving back down here again I'd see him, but I should be able to lay low enough that he wouldn't see me. Now I have a tiny one-man tent I bring with me, but I didn't set it up this night because I wanted to be ready to start running if I needed to. Also it's bright yellow and pretty easy to spot in the trees. I had covered it up with dead leaves and brush in the past while camping in places I probably wasn't supposed to camp, but tonight I wasn't taking any chances. I set my pack down next to me on the ground and took a seat on a small fallen over tree trunk. Sifting through my things I was able to find my small knife packed away among my clothes, just in case. I told myself wondering if I'd be able to use this if it came down to it. I've never been a violent person, and I'd never been in a situation like this before so I wasn't sure yet how I'd react. The shaking in my arms and legs had started to subside and I started to realize just how tired I had become. The contents of my pack still scattered around the ground in front of me I realized I hadn't eaten anything since lunch, if you could call it that. All at once the realization of how hungry I was struck me. Most of the food I had on me was just more dry ramen like I had before, light, inexpensive and high calories. Though I had a little bit of trail mix left in a plastic baggie, and I mixed what was left of my water canteen with some flavored juice crystals and drank that down with it. I rolled my ground cover out over a dry patch of ground and got in my sleeping bag and curled up inside it exhausted. Though I was so scared I couldn't imagine I would be able to sleep and I stayed awake a long while staring off in the direction of the road as darkness crept over my campsite. I kept imagining the man yelling at me from his car again and again with that dry raspy voice. His voice had been so eerie, you could definitely tell he wasn't mentally stable. Anyways, at some point I must have fallen asleep, because I woke up with a start to a bright light passing over me. For a few beautiful seconds I couldn't remember where I was. Then it all came back to me, hitting me like a sack of bricks. I startled up, not thinking clearly and looked around me. That light? What had it been? I could still see it, traveling off in the distance away from me. Headlights, I could see them, though they were still going away. Luckily for me, whoever it was, it hadn't stopped. Pulling the sleeping bag up around me as tightly as possible for comfort, I scanned the roadway. The headlights were getting further and further away. Maybe it wasn't even him? The ordeal might be over by now. For all he knows, I got picked up and was long gone. Suddenly, the headlights stopped in their tracks and seemed to do a U-turn on the road and were coming back in this direction now. I was driving home with my wife last Sunday night after spending the week visiting family. I think a lot of people, like me and my wife, have an unspoken agreement to not pick up hitchhikers. We were taught growing up that anyone on the side of the road was probably some sort of serial killer or kidnapper wanting to catch anyone kind enough to pull over for them, so we just drive on by pretending we don't see them. When I was driving that night, I saw an elderly woman standing beside the road with her thumb out. I almost didn't see her since she was hunched over in a black coat that blended into the dark. But the wrinkled skin of her hand was so white and pale that it was practically blinding. Like I said before, I don't pick up hitchhikers. I never pick up hitchhikers. However, for some reason, I locked eyes with the poor woman and my body just worked on its own to pull over and let her in. I didn't think about it, really, but I could tell from my wife's side glance that I fed up. The car ride itself was fine, I think. At one point my wife accepted some homemade peanut brittle from the older woman, which was surprising to say the least. I took it as a sign that she was starting to see that the woman wasn't going to hurt us and that I made the right decision. But as you'll read soon, I was definitely wrong. 
When we finally dropped the woman off, me and my wife sat together in the car to talk for a bit. It started off with a light conversation about how she wished that I had asked her first before making that decision and whatnot. But in the middle of talking, she just kind of zoned out. I kept trying to explain to her that I wasn't thinking about my actions and that I was sorry. But she just started telling me to drive. She was getting more and more urgent about it, which I didn't understand until I looked out the rearview mirror. The elderly woman that we had just dropped off was sprinting, not running, sprinting towards our car at full speed, sobbing and screaming random nonsense like, she's not me, and I'm not her. Needless to say, I put the pedal to the metal and drove the hell out of Dodge. We haven't talked since that night. If we dropped that woman off about five minutes too late, she probably would have acted crazy in the car and gotten at least one of us hurt. I feel horrible about my actions that night, and my wife's silence is only making me feel worse. I understand that she is mad, but instead of trying to talk it out, she just stares at me. It always happens when my back is turned or when I think I'm alone, and I think she does it to freak me out to make me feel the same way she felt that night in the car or something. There's been nights where I accidentally wake up too early from a deep sleep, and I can just feel her eyes staring at me from behind my back. There was even a time recently when I was doing work on my computer and that feeling of being watched came back. But after turning around and seeing that no one was in the room, I just ignored it and went back to typing. After a little bit, I finished up what I was doing and got up from my chair to stretch when I saw her peering out of the closet. Her eyes were so wide that it almost looked like she didn't even have eyelids. And her fingers that were holding the edge of the sliding door were long and spindly like spider legs. It scared the shit out of me, and when I confronted her about it, she just slinked out of the room and into the kitchen. It took a little while for me to collect my thoughts before following her lead and heading to the kitchen. Not necessarily because I wanted to be around her at that moment, but so I could check on her and be there if she decided to talk. I vividly remember seeing my lover hunched over a fresh pan of peanut brittle, steaming as its heat fought against the cold air that hung around her presence. She wouldn't have noticed me if I hadn't gasped in shock at her appearance, which I feel terrible saying about my wife, but she had those same lidless eyes that looked like they were about to roll right out of their sockets. Her head snapped in my direction, her joints popping into place as she started to slither towards me. I need to go to bed, I told her while backing myself against the bedroom door. I'm not hungry right now, but thank you. She kept moving towards me like I hadn't said anything at all. Her teeth chattered and her long nails clicked against the hardwood floor when she decided it would be better to crawl towards me on all fours, limbs overlapping each other like some fucked up game of Twister. I was terrified at this point, but my words came out of me as if they were brewed from anger. Screw this. You may not be ready to talk to me yet, but I will never be ready to deal with this bullshit. I'm going to bed. Feel free to sleep on the couch if you're going to act like this. I went into our room and locked the door before hiding under the blanket, like a kid afraid of what could be lurking in the darkness of his room. I was too scared to feel sorry for her at this point, because this was the point I began realizing that this was not the woman I married. The last straw was when I woke up today to the smell of peanuts. When I was slowly opening my eyes and adjusting to the light, there was a blurred image of my wife sitting on top of my chest holding a broken piece of brittle to my mouth. Eat! She growled at me in a weathered voice while the peanut brittle kissed my bottom lip. This was the first time she had spoken to me since that night with the hitchhiker. This one word stuck to me like glitter on my scalp. And up until now I had no clue the impact a single word could have on a human being. I inched myself up from the bed and took the brittle in my hand. My eyes locked with hers in a stare. Thank you, I said. I'll eat this while I'm on my way to work. I needed some sort of excuse to leave the house, and I prayed that the woman I had previously believed to be my wife didn't know that I worked from home. She screamed at me in response, a loud wordless shriek that rattled my eardrums, before coiling her hands around my throat like a python to its prey. I was trying to tell her to stop. I really was, but the sentences only bubbled out as wasted oxygen as I struggled to get myself free. I was clawing and digging my fingers into whatever cracks and crevices I could find between my neck and her hands, 
thrashing and pulling myself away from the impossible strength my wife possessed as if I were an animal trying to escape a bear trap, but she only squeezed harder and screamed louder. Then she let go. The hands that had been cupped around my throat went limp and fell to my shoulders before sliding down my chest and resting by her sides. I looked up to see half of her face gone, replaced by what looked like a dropped bowl of spaghetti, before her body collapsed to its side and rolled onto the bedroom floor. The room was strangely quiet while I watched the blood pool around her head and sink through the cracks of the hardwood floor, but eventually a familiar voice snapped me free from the shock. I didn't know. Didn't know what to do. I... The words slurred together, somehow both sounding calm and panicked. I looked up to see the hitchhiker from the other night, standing and shaking in the doorway while using all of her strength left to lift a shotgun to her chest while the barrel pointed at my dead wife on the floor. I could feel my stomach flip and knot itself so tight that I almost threw up. Baby, I murmured, both as a statement and a question. The woman didn't stray from where she stood, but she acknowledged my voice with a whimper. Oh God, oh Jesus, what have I done? What have I done? She dropped the gun and slipped to her knees, running her fingers through the thin strands of gray hair that clung to her head. I ran to her without any questions or second thoughts. I held her tight in my arms and rubbed her back, comforting her while we both sobbed in each other's arms. It's been a few hours since all of this happened. We have both calmed down, mostly. It didn't take too long for my wife to begin looking like her original self, but the tightening of her skin and shifting of her bone structure was not the most comfortable experience for her. Being questioned by the police was relatively straightforward. Both my wife and I stood by the same story that an elderly woman entered our home after offering her homemade goods before attempting to kill us both. My wife had shot her out of self-defense, and we are both in shock from the horrors of the situation. The policeman nodded while jotting something down in a tiny spiral notepad acting like there wasn't an elderly woman with only half a face right in the other room. It's over now. We were thanked for our time before getting kicked out of our own house so they could clean up the leftover death. I am sitting in the car typing this with my wife in the passenger's seat and two suitcases in the trunk, ready to head over to a nice little motel nearby to stay a few nights. The engine is running. The radio is playing music that is drowned in static and I take one last look out the window to watch the cops pop pieces of peanut brittle into their mouths before driving off. This took place during the late summer of 1993. I was living in Montana but had a boyfriend in British Columbia, and I often traveled between the two places. We were broke and carless, so we hitchhiked when we needed to get somewhere further than biking distance. I had spent the month of August with him in BC, and eventually it was time to go back to school. I, of course, not having worked much all summer, had no money. My bum-ass BF hadn't come through with any money for a bus ticket either. My parents were mad at me, so they weren't giving me any money. All my friends were broke, but we didn't have a phone to call them anyway. We were living in a two-room cabin with no running water in the mountains. The only phone was a party line that belonged to the neighbors, and was basically only for emergencies. The decision was made. I was already two days late for school, and I didn't feel like panhandling for a bus ticket. I had to get back and couldn't wait for the BF's money to materialize. It would be my first time hitchhiking alone. I put my backpack's worth of stuff together, making sure I had my ID because one time we hitched to the border, left Canada, and tried to get into the US before I realized I had left my ID in Canada meaning I had no ID to enter the US, but also no ID to get back into Canada. But that's a story for another day and hit the road. Things went surprisingly smoothly for the majority of the trip. An elderly couple picked me up as soon as I got off the mountain and into town and took me all the way to Creston, right near the border crossing. I walked across and was picked up almost immediately by a guy who at first gave me the mild creeps, but all he did was lecture me about how dangerous it was to hitchhike alone and how much I reminded him of his daughter. He took me all the way to Coeur d'Alene, which was damn near half the trip. I was actually having phenomenal luck. I walked to just outside the city limits and stuck my thumb out. One hour went by, then two. You're often walking really slowly when you're trying to catch a ride and eventually, 
I came across a small flap of cardboard. I picked it up, thinking I could walk off at the next exit, borrow a marker at a gas station, and make a sign I thought that might help me get a ride. So I'm walking along a little faster now, and suddenly I see something moving in my peripheral vision. I tense, look, and see that it's a two feet, thin, dark snake trying to get over the cement guardrail to the shoulder. He was never gonna make it, he was kind of trying to throw himself over it sideways. I happened to kind of like snakes and he looked pretty harmless, so I used my sign as a shovel and pitched him over the wall. In hindsight, I should have realized the snake was a bad omen. Before I could reach the next exit, a car slowed to a stop. It's always creepy when a car stops and you're walking up to it, trying to judge if it's Ted Bundy or just an eccentric like you. My heart always sank a little when it would be a single man, but I soon realized he wasn't alone. There was a kid in the front seat who looked to be age 10 to 13. The guy was a little too friendly, but what was he gonna do? Murder me in front of the kid. I decided to get in. The man was pretty chatty, introducing the kid as his nephew. He said they were driving back to where they lived in St. Louis from visiting his brother in Seattle so the kid could visit his grandma. The kid hardly said a word. If I remember, and it's been a very long time, it's about three hours to where I lived from Kerr Delane. He was taking Highway 90 right past the city I lived in, so I was relieved I wouldn't have to get out of the car and thumb it again. The first hour goes by, and it's friendly chit-chat lots of family anecdotes and general small talk. The switchblade my BF gave me was cradled in the bottom of my palm the whole time, up my sleeve and out of view, but I began to relax a little. He kept up the friendly chatter, but eventually the questions he was asking took a raunchier turn, like did I have a boyfriend, what was he like, what did we like to do, what was our favorite position, a uh, what? I silently panicked like oh fuck fuck fuck, this guy is a creep after all. My instinct was to play along with his conversation while I tried to figure out what to do. I was pretty sure the drink he had in the console had more than pop in it, because you could see him physically getting looser as the drive went on. He kept asking gross questions, and I was so embarrassed for his nephew but still playing along. I just tried to breathe deeply to keep from having an anxiety attack and concentrated on extricating myself from his car. Eventually, he made it clear that he expected me to have sex with him in exchange for the ride. Door-to-door -door service, he said. Then it got worse. And find one of your girlfriends for my nephew, he said, with this hyper-cheerful, also menacing smile that made my stomach drop. Yeah, I had to get away from this guy SAP. At this point, we were about 20 minutes from the town I lived in. I was like, sure, sure, and started making stuff up about a phantom hot slutty friend I had. Then, it finally hit me what I could do to get away. I put on my best come hither smile and said to him, you know what? I bet she's home now. Let's go straight over to her place when we get to town and get this date started. So I had him get off at my exit and asked if we could get some beer first for our date. In Montana, you could buy beer at gas stations, so I had him stop at a place a few blocks from where I lived. When he somewhat reluctantly went inside to buy beer, which I knew was in the back of the store, I opened my door and sprinted down the alley about a block and dove into a huge clump of bushes, folded myself up as tight as I could, and waited. I still had my knife, but now it was out of my sleeve. I was shaking and my heart was pounding so hard I was afraid it would explode. I tucked my head into my knees and waited, listening for his car to come down the alley. When had got to the gas station, it was about 4 p.m. in September, so there was still plenty of light. I stayed in those damn bushes until night fell, and then I finally sprinted home. His car never came down the alley, but I could hear him yelling for me. He sounded pissed. I got in my front door, locked the deadbolt and collapsed, dirt and little leaves all over me. My roommate was like, what the fuck happened to you? I told her the abbreviated version and she said, why didn't you call me? I would have picked you up at the border.